this is Indian Country Today. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahan. These are the news headlines for Tuesday, July 14th. The Washington NFL team quits its racist name and the reaction from Native America is largely ecstatic. Suzanne Harjo, who has been in this fight as long as anyone, measures how much progress there has been made in getting rid of mascots. When you eliminate two thirds of anything, she said, you have already changed society. Crystal Equahawk from the nonprofit group Illuminative wrote Monday, we will not rest until the offensive use of native imagery, logos and names are eradicated from professional, collegiate and K-12 sports. The pressure is now on other sports franchises to change their name. On Monday, Ian Washburn of rebrand Washington football brought a group to the old RFK stadium. He thanked all of the native women who led this fight for decades. The team has officially ended the R word and the current imagery. We're happy about that. Yeah. But we remain cautiously optimistic. The team has not selected a new name or new mascot. And we remain concerned that there could be native themes in that new mascot or new name, which we don't want. So this battle is not over. There's no indication when there will be a new name for the NFL team. Nakota Lawrence, a champion hoop dancer who traveled the world performing with Cirque du Soleil, has died at the age of 30. Lawrence is Tewa, Hopi, Navajo, and Assiniboine. He completed the annual Herd World Championship Hoop Dance Contest for many years, earning the title of world champion three times. Nakota was known for delivering fearless and thrilling performances, said Dan Haggerty from the Herd Museum in Phoenix. His risk-taking in the hoop arena resulted in unforgettable performances, and he will forever remain a fan favorite. Next, we're joined by ICT's Washington editor, Jordan bennett Begay. Jordan, across the country, there has been a lot of hope that the tide was turning on COVID-19. Tribes like states were opening up, but now things are tightening up again. Jordan, where does Indian country stand? And Mark, as you know, your tribe in Idaho, the Shoshone Bannock, is seeing an increase of COVID-19 cases. The tribe reported a total of 26 positive cases since the pandemic started. And of these 26 cases, 25 are on the Fort Hall reservation and one is off the reservation. And tribal officials sent out a press release saying tribal contact tracers are immediately notified and stay in contact with these positive cases and the tribe even hired more as part of the contact tracing team. And it seems that you know, the Shoshone Bannock are acting fast and have actually a better handle on the outbreak with its contact tracers compared to the rest of the country. Because just last week, a health expert told CNN's uh, Anderson Cooper that he doesn't see how contact tracing is possible at this point, especially in the Southern United States where the virus is spreading very fast. And in other areas where tribes didn't see any or very few cases, the numbers are growing, especially if they're in hotspots like Oklahoma or Arizona, particularly tribes near the metropolitan areas. And for tribes that were hit hard, hard early on, like the Navajo Nation or the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, the cases seem to be slowing down a bit, but they're still trickling in. And so here's a look at the rest of the numbers from our database. There are 13,478 positive cases and 556 deaths in the Indian health system. Again, that is a total of 13,478 positive cases and 556 deaths as of July 14th. The Cherokee Nation, Oklahoma saw a surge in COVID-19 cases in the last few days. The tribe reported 69 new cases, bringing the total to 354. The Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians in Mississippi reported 36 new cases. And in North Carolina, the Eastern Band Cherokee Indians have three more cases, giving them a total of 86 cases and two deaths. And the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation in North Dakota have six more cases, bringing their total to 52. And the Mescalero Apache Tribe in New Mexico have nine additional cases, bringing their total to 20. And the White Mountain Apache Tribe reported eight new cases, while the Navajo Nation reported 56 new cases. Thank you for those numbers, Jordan. Thank you, Mark. We'll be right back. This is Indian Country Today.
this is Indian country today. Nearly 50 years ago, the Native American Rights Fund was established as a public interest law firm. NARF has been involved in issues ranging from enforcing treaty rights to supporting sovereignty. NARF has been a legal voice on natural resources, healthcare, education, voting rights, religious freedom, just about every issue that crosses Indian country. John Echohawk was a co-founder of NARF in 1971. When he started law school in the 1960s, there were only a dozen or so Native American lawyers. Today, there are more than 2,500. John Echohawk, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mark. Yesterday was a really amazing day. Let's start by talking about the Washington NFL team and mascots in general. Well, these uh, uh, human rights issues have always been uh, one of the priority issues the Native American Rights Fund uh, focuses on. And uh, uh, we go way back working with, uh, with Suzanne Harjo uh, against uh, that uh, uh, offensive name of that team. And uh, uh, we were uh, uh, involved in the litigation that she started trying to uh, eliminate their trademark. We represented the National Congress of American Indians as uh, Amicus Curiae, friend of the court brief in that litigation. And of course, as, as you know, it ended up basically the Supreme Court in another case, deciding that uh, uh, under the First Amendment, uh, uh, a trademark could be anything, whether it was offensive or not. And uh, you know, we've, we've stayed with that issue ever since, uh, working on these mascot issues around the country. And uh, always uh, bring the information forward about how it's really uh, damaging to our children to see those images and uh, uh, you know be portrayed as uh, as caricatures what what i thought was so brilliant about that whole litigation even though it wasn't ultimately successful was the idea that if you want to use this name use it but you can't make money off of it and you can't protect it i thought that was a fascinating approach mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how did that come about uh, uh, well, uh, law and uh, politics is very strange, and uh, you never know what the outcome of these cases are, are going to be, Mark. Okay. Well, let's get to the law. Last week was also a pretty amazing week for the law, with the Supreme Court basically affirming sovereignty. Uh, this has been quite a run in the Supreme Court lately. Let's talk about that. Okay. Uh, you know, being uh, involved in these issues over the last 50 years, of course, the uh, uh, ultimate uh, decision maker is the U.S. Supreme Court. So that's always been uh, our focus. They're basically the ones who uh, uh, decide what federal Indian law is. And uh, there in the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, uh, we had a nice run there where uh, uh, tribes won most of their cases going up before the court. And there was an inordinate number of those cases going up because for so many years, uh, we didn't really have any legal representation on our, on our issues because, you know, our people of course, the poor couldn't afford lawyers. But then when we came along as a nonprofit and started raising money, making these lawyers available to our people to bring up these important cases, then things really took off. And so all these issues that had been pinned up got finally addressed by the Supreme Court. We won most of them. But then as, uh, as uh, the makeup of the Supreme Court started changing in the 90s and into, into the early 2000s, we saw a change in uh, uh, the decisions the Supreme Court was making uh, with more conservative justices. Uh, we weren't winning as many of those cases. And finally, it got to the point in 2001 where there were four cases. We should have won all of those cases based on the federal Indian law we knew, but we lost all of them. And tribal leaders really picked up on that because you know this has been a growing crisis, and all of a sudden they saw it was very real. So they called a national meeting in Washington D.C. Why? Because there's a crisis in Indian country. It's called the United States Supreme Court. What are we going to do about this? We've been living on this litigation for three decades now. The modern tribal sovereignty movement. All of a sudden, you know, we can't go to court anymore because we're going to lose every time. So. The uh, tribal leaders put together this tribal Supreme Court project to try to do better in the court, deal with these conservative justices. And another one of the things they did is uh, uh, started looking at how these justices get on the court, who nominates them, uh, how they're confirmed, 
so they got us involved in that process together with the NCEI. So now every time there's a vacancy on the court, there's a new nominee, they have us research the federal Indian law record of that nominee, tell the tribal leaders that, and then they decide whether they're gonna support that justice or not. Most recently, uh, in, in this uh, uh, administration, uh, there was a vacancy uh, that uh, President uh, uh, Trump filled with uh, uh, Neil Gorsuch. And so we did uh, the search on his record. It was, uh, it was a good record. We reported that to the tribal leaders. They uh, supported him and of course he, he got confirmed. He's been on the court. He knows it's federal Indian law these last two terms. Now there have been three Indian treaty cases. The tribes have won all three of those, five to four. Justice Gorsuch has been that fifth vote together with the uh, four liberal justices on the court. So it's kind of a new day in the Supreme Court these days. I was at the Supreme Court for the Hera uh, arguments and I was really struck by how pointed the questions were from Justice Gorsuch. It's not that he just was uh, aware of the law, he was aware of the fine points of the law. Yes, yes, he knows his federal Indian law very well. He uh, uh, was a, a judge on the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals uh, in Denver for a number of years. And of course, there's uh, uh, many tribes in that uh, 10th Circuit area. So he had a lot of experience uh, dealing with those uh, federal Indian law issues. Plus being a Westerner, he, he knows tribes and he knows uh, native people and uh, it's very helpful. The other shift in the court that is kind of extraordinary is that under the Rehnquist court, so much of um, some of the latest decisions invented law. And there's this whole idea that conservatives are supposed to pay attention to what the law is, but um, an Indian law cases, that certainly wasn't the case. Well, we've got, uh, uh, again, uh, Justice uh, Gorsuch is leading the way and uh, his uh, real focus is on uh, separation of powers. And, uh, you know, Congress, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, approved the treaties and they're the only ones who can change it and not the judges. And so he really looks at, uh, at the language of the treaties and whether Congress has changed anything. And it doesn't matter what the judges think. If Congress didn't act to change the treaties, then the treaty's still in full force and effect. One thing we mentioned in, in your introduction, John, is the idea of the growth of Indian lawyers. Uh, I think one of the unqualified success stories would be the changes in Indian law schools, Indian law programs at law schools. And I know you've been a big part of that, but you look at, there are now deans at law schools, there are a significant number of faculty. Uh, first talk about law schools, but then I'm wondering, how do you then apply that to the federal judiciary? Uh, well, we've, uh, uh, you know, come a long way since, uh, uh, I started law school back in 1967 as part of the uh, first Indian Law Scholarship Program that was created by the, uh, Office, of Econ the Op Office of Economic Opportunity as part of the War on Poverty because we didn't have uh, any uh, professionals, uh, hardly, as you mentioned, just a, just a dozen or so uh, Native American lawyers, very few doctors, and uh, they thought, well, let's try to get uh, some of the Indians to go to graduate school and become lawyers and doctors and things. So. Uh, I was in the right place at the right time. They contracted that program out to the University of New Mexico, right where I was. I had just graduated in political science, wanted to go to law school, went to the law school, said, you get my uh, application, and also, could you give me some scholarship information? They said, you look like an Indian, could you come see the dean? So I walked in the dean's office and he said, I hear you are interested in a scholarship and I've got one for you. And he told me all about the war on poverty and everything, and so, me and several Native American law students started that, that fall there at UNM and to the credit of that faculty, they put together one of the first courses ever taught in law school about federal Indian law. And it was an eye opener for me and the other Native students. And we realized that on the reservations, our tribal leaders didn't really know this. Most of them didn't have lawyers at all. And so we needed lawyers. This uh, uh, civil rights movement was going on there at that time and uh, everything was changing. Those uh, uh, equal rights cases were being brought forward by nonprofits like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. Hey, we need a Native American Legal Defense Fund. So away we went, and it uh, really kind of changed everything. Uh, uh, 
you know, as we've already mentioned, the number of Native American lawyers have grown in law schools. Virtually all the Western law schools now teach federal Indian law. A number of the Eastern law schools teach it. And now even out West with the bar exams, uh, there's usually Indian law questions on there because these days most legal practitioners are going to run into an Indian law question sooner or later because things have changed. We're on the map. One thing I remember when I was a young reporter was um, the amount of money that was being paid to basically non-Indian off-reservation law firms who would come in for an hour or two and then leave. And now with the growth of uh, tribal members who practice law, the whole relationship between governance and law is really different. Yes, it is. And of course, a number of the tribes these days have their own legal department, their own uh, tribal attorneys general, and uh, uh, you know, things are, are much different now than they used to be. I was thinking the other day was the 50th anniversary of the return of Blue Lake. And um, th that also came about, NARP came up just right after that, where you had that summer in 1970 when so much was going on. Uh, if you look at how history has changed since then, it's really remarkable in a lot of ways. Uh, yes, it sure has, and it really kind of started there in 1970. As you know, Mark, another thing that happened at that time was uh, President Nixon, uh, in his uh, message to uh, Congress about uh, Native American policy, became the first president to articulate the Indian self-determination policy, and the first president to clearly reject the termination policy, which had been the policy in the 50s and into the 60s. and uh, uh, it was President Nixon who did that, and of course it's President Nixon who signed that Blue Lake uh, bill that uh, returned those sacred lands back to the Taos Pueblo. There's an interesting parallel there because we were last week watching uh, the 4th of July uh, activities in the Black Hills, and of course uh, many of the Lakota see that land as sacred and have been saying so from a uh, long time. And it was very similar to the Taos Pueblo who kept unflinchingly saying, Blue Lake is ours, Blue Lake is ours, and we'll have it back. And it took from 1906 to 1970 for it to happen, but it did happen. And that long view of history, I think, is really interesting in Indian country. Yes, we never give up. We gotta be persistent. Uh, you know, that's, that's a good example. And of course, what we started with, the uh, change in the team name of the Washington NFL team, I mean, that was decades in the making as well. And we so many, give up. yeah, and sophisticated, strategies on multiple, I mean, it was like a multidimensional chess game. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. One of the other lessons out of that era, and I think it kind of picked up both with Gorsuch and with Richard Nixon, is that Indian Affairs is really bipartisan. It's on its own plane, and you can educate people on both sides. Yes, and uh, uh, tribal leaders always uh, uh, make that clear that uh, our issues are not uh, uh, you know, Democratic issues or Republican issues, they're, they're, you know, basically national issues, they're nonpartisan. That's the way they dealt with uh, on the Hill. Uh, you know, senators and congressmen from both parties say that over and over, that uh, you know, these are not partisan issues and uh, we want to deal with them, uh, you know, fairly. And uh, that, that's really made a difference and uh, over the years, basically, uh, uh, they've come to listen to our tribal leaders and uh, basically kind of uh, reinstitute that uh, that treaty relationship, government to government relationship, where uh, any more and nothing they they try to do against us passes, and the only thing that happens there are things that we support, and that that's a tremendous change from uh, from years past. One thing, um, one area where NARP has been really exceptional lately is on voting rights and both the protection of voting rights, but more important, uh, chronicling the problems with voting rights. Uh, how, how did that project get started? Well, well it uh, really uh, sprung out of this uh, tribal Supreme Court project again, uh, uh, again with the uh, change in the makeup of the Supreme Court. Uh, one of the things that happened uh, back in uh, uh, I think it was 2013, I think seven years ago, the Supreme Court uh, uh, decided a case called Shelby County. And in that case, basically, they gutted the Federal Voting Rights Act of the, of the provision, the key provision in that act, 
which required uh, pre-clearance of changes in state voting laws by the Justice Department before they went into effect because uh, you know there are a lot of uh, discriminatory changes in voting laws that states were trying to do and so that's why the Voting Rights Act was passed was to stop that and so a, a key provision was the pre-clearance in 2013 in the Shelby County case the Supreme Court uh, declared that uh, invalid unconstitutional and so the states could uh, pass any kind of changes in voting rights laws that they wanted and guess what they started doing it and they impacted our people and other minority people as well and now to stop that we all have to go to federal court and get the federal courts in long uh, long long drawn out legal proceedings to declare those laws unconstitutional and so we had to step up to the plate and help uh, Indian or Indian country organize across the board to fight all these changes in state voting rights laws that were starting to uh, uh, impact our people and that fight's still going on. Well, and this year it's gonna be a particularly uh, important challenge with the idea that um, in a pandemic, we're gonna be voting differently anyway. Yes, uh, uh, and we have to uh, make sure that we uh, are able to get our people out uh, uh, as part of our work in the voting rights area. We did uh, a series of hearings across the country where we uh, uh, explored uh, the obstacles to uh, Indian voting. And uh, based on all of those hearings over the years, we put together a report that was recently released that talks about all the obstacles that our people face uh, trying to vote. And uh, we uh, worked with then uh, uh, Senator Udall and others there in the Congress to uh, put together a, a Native American Voting Rights Act that addresses all of those issues that uh, causes, uh, causes us problems in terms of trying to vote, and that's pending in the Congress right now. Are you seeing bipartisan support for that legislation? Uh, yes, we are, but of course, as you know, that's a very volatile political issue on the Hill, so it hasn't passed yet whether it's gonna pass here before the election, we're not really sure, but uh, uh, we're doing the best we can to try to get the word out about all these obstacles, uh, you know, all these uh, problems that exist out in the states and you know, just trying to uh, uh, you know, make uh, the situation come November as good as possible for Native American voters. One of the things um, I think that comes out of the court when it rule on sovereignty is in a way it forces tribes and states and local governments to work together. Whenever that happens, it seems like good things come out of that. Yes, and, uh, and more and more, uh, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the norm these days. Back in the old days, it didn't really happen when we first started in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so many of these uh, governors and attorney generals from the states, they didn't know, what's this tribal sovereignty? You know, how come we don't have jurisdiction over your lands? Are you telling us we don't have jurisdiction on your lands? Uh, yes, sir, that's what these treaties, oh, well, where did that come from? Anyway, they finally learned, and so now uh, so much of the business is done through intergovernmental agreements between tribes and states, local governments, and uh, uh, that's kind of a norm these days, and uh, that norm is going to come in handy here as, uh, as the tribes there in Oklahoma together with the state of Oklahoma and the federal government address the issues that now exist as a result of the uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision earlier uh, this week in McGirt. In so many ways, tribes and states can be just more effective serving both their constituencies. You look at programs like Medicaid and the Indian Health System, and there are resources you can build on rather than shrink. Yes, yes, uh, working together, uh, cooperative arrangements, uh, and, and, and as I said, I, that, that's happening more and more and people understand that that's the way to do business. Uh, this, uh, this nation's made up of, uh, of three governments, the federal government, the state governments, and the tribal governments, and everybody has to understand that and we all have to work together. And it reinforced the idea that treaties are the supreme law of the land and it's not just a catchphrase. Right, they are. We're, we're sovereigns just like the states and the federal government. John Echohawk, thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to future conversations. Thanks again, Mark, for having me. Thank you for uh, joining us for another edition of Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahant, thank you.
is Indian country today.